I'm a Google Hangouts version. Virgin. Oh, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Google, <laughs> virgin, Google Hangout Virgin here. <laughs> with that, with that great introduction. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today, I'm here with uh, Diana Castle. Uh, thanks. Uh, for joining me for this discussion, for this casual discussion um, about um, the baby in the well, the case uh, against empathy by Paul Bloom, which is what we want to talk about. But I guess we should introduce you more in terms of your um, what you're doing. You have a organization, uh, the Imagined Life, acting as the art of empathic imagination um, in Los Angeles and a, a theater there and you do acting training and yeah. it's really based on empathy so so I'm really excited about that and Me to too. hear that perspective we want to talk about that perspective and how it relates to the you know Paul Bloom's article well I always first I just want to say thank you I always love these dialogues with you and I'm you know so encouraged by what you're doing in the world. I think that, um, have it with me. <laughs> oh, great. You know, once, uh, I think that it all begins, the perspective, the case against empathy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, inherent in that framing, uh, I think Mr. Bloom is really appealing to what is, uh, he calls our inherent Cartesian dualism. Mm -hmm. And the minute we're for and against something, it's a pretty short jump mm -hmm. to hunter and hunted, right? Kill or be killed. So, and I, I don't think that he's encouraging that thinking, but he calls for a dispassionate analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, a more, a more cold-blooded way of solving problems. So he talks about the spark of empathy in the cauldron, let it be, you know, a spice, and let the rest of the cauldron or the rest of the soup be reason. And I think setting it up as a case for and against, the very dispassionate analysis that he is talking about is in dispassion or detachment is inherent in dualistic thinking. Mm. I can't kill you if I am not other than you. And so he talks about empathy as narrow-minded, parochial, but I think it takes pretty narrow vision to aim. I think it takes pretty limited scope to kill somebody off. So this whole idea of for and against, either or, right, wrong, good, bad, is the moral thinking that's um, our current perspective mm -hmm. generally. I think mm -hmm. well, it's Well, let me re reflect what I'm hearing. So, so far you're saying that the very framing of the article is like the case against empathy. So it's kind of setting up a us and them or, or kind of a du dualistic kind of a, a way of of looking at the world, you're calling it Cartesian, and the very framing of that is saying, and you're kind of describing what you're seeing, that it's kind of like the metaphor of a cauldron, and the cauldron is this us and them, and against, for and against, and that's the nature of the cauldron, and within that is this little spark of empathy, but it's all within this basic uh, against, for and against kind of a cauldron, so he's kind of like even framing the whole thing in a in a certain uh, kind of a way, which is kind of uh, low on empathy in and of itself. It sounds like exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly, Edwin. That I think of it more like if you think of a of a of a, of a piece of paper, you know, empathy and reason cannot be severed. They are two sides, but not. Two, but not two. Mm -hmm. um, and they hold up the piece of paper, in my mind, upon which the story of moral consequences will be written. So, if we're going to think of two, but not two thinking, we have to begin to think more like a mother. Mm -hmm. And the mother and child may be independent. It's like the little, wonderful little uh, drawing you have on the website of the trees. The, and the roots beneath are so interconnected 
the dynamism of independent and interdependent reason and empathy, I think, creates a third kind of moral uh, moral perspective, which mm -hmm. is wisdom. The wisdom that comes from not cold-blooded dispassion, but warm-hearted empathic reasoning. Mm -hmm. So, so it's really saying that the trees were there, that the trees were... Oh, well, that picture of the trees is they're, they're there and they're actually connected underneath at the roots. So it's the roots. It might look at the surface. You're look, if you're looking at the surface, you're seeing the disconnected trees, but you don't realize that there's kind of a wisdom. I guess that's the wisdom of... The, they're really connected underneath. That deeper is wisdom that, of mm -hmm. understanding that... You know, he talks about uh, empathy as enumerate. So, i.e., um, you know, we empathize I, the victim identity. You know, we can we can identify with one, but not with five million. I don't think that's true. When we come from, um, there are two parts here that uh, I want to talk about. One is empathy is a gut reflex. I mean, all through the article, he he does continue to refer to it as a gut reflex, as if somehow. We can't come to empathy as a, you know, as a predetermined conscious stance. A actors do this all the mm -hmm. time. When we meet material, we say, I come predetermined, with a predetermined empathic stance to accept perspectives, beliefs, opinions, cultural influences, mm -hmm. geography. Before I even come to understanding, I come already, I'm, I come ready to, with a thin skin, and V.S. Ramachandran speaks brilliantly in his TED talk about this, the mirror neurons that change civilization, that we come as artists, professional empathizers, with an understanding that the words are the reason, they're very reasonable, but we have to crack beyond the left brain word into a spoken truth. And in order to find spoken truths, our job is to empathize, not dispassionately, not as subject-object, but to stand in the shoes from the geographical, political, cultural, religious influences. Mm. Now, uh, did you read that article? I have it here about that that just came out. I think you'd love this. Peter Buffett, Warren Buffett's son, wrote in the... Mm. Oh, my gosh. This article on Sunday is about the charitable, charitable industrial complex. And he's talking about charity, philanthropy, and the new philanthropy, which is almost a new industry now, because the poverty is so large in the world, um, as film... Philanthrop philanthropic colonialism. Mm -hmm. That we are making decisions without regard for culture, geography, or societal norms. Of course, that's when you end up giving malaria nets and people fish with them. And I think Paul Bloom, he has a son. He's married. I don't think that he really would like it if his son were bullied. Uh, I think he would want the bully -er to be the bully to be uh, empathic. So I don't think he's really calling for a dispassionate analysis without regard for empathic experience of culture, empathic experience of religious beliefs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was hearing there to begin with is it's like you're talking about um, there's a he that uh, you, what you're hearing Paul say is that oh we're plodding along through life and suddenly we have this empathic spontaneous empathic uh, moment. Reflect. Got reflex. It kind of comes out of nowhere. It's like, oh, what, what? Something hit me. I, got, I suddenly got hit by empathy, right? It's like, oh my goodness, I got hit by empathy, and it's this gut reflex. And you're saying that actors actually, who they actually come into life and into situations with a predetermined. You didn't say the word intention, but it's kind of like they have this uh, intention to uh, empathize and to connect. So they're already kind of like pre looking f with empathic eyes at what's happening and, and trying to uh, connect with it in a experiential, putting themselves into the experience of, of the other and into the environment. 
Um, so you're kind of saying that that's like the difference of, of how actors kind of approach it and how it's, he's kind of like saying uh, empathy works. Well, I think, uh, you know, professional empathizers grasp that we can't come to the experience of reasoning, understanding where another person is coming from if we're in the subject-object relationship. Mm -hmm. If we're oh. in the mm -hmm. for, against, either, or, both, and, right, wrong, good, bad relationship. Now morality is thought of as good and bad. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for a new morality because we know that what's good for one is bad for another. So to say, to come at the whole question of moral implications, which is what he's interested in, what are the moral implications of empathy running the show, mm -hmm. to come at it with the stance of for and against is to already take the air out of what could be an alternative perspective, both and thinking. We know that what's good for our culture might be very bad in another person's culture. And so why not start from what he does assert, which is we start with the value of life. All mm -hmm. of us want our, our most basic instinct is to stay alive and the value of life. So a more a, a more um, a philosophy of value creation, you know. There's yeah. a book I, I well, wanted to I, if you, Yeah, let me give you, I try to reflect this here to follow. Love, it kind of helps me it. to follow, follow <laughs> along where you are. Also so, yeah, absolutely, I love it. And, and so you're, you're like saying that um, that he's already, there's already a, a, you know, a good, bad, for and against, there's all this duality kind of thinking way of being, and that in itself, that way of thinking inhibits empathic connection, because if you're trying to connect like with the artist, the artist is trying to put themselves into the, you know, into the experience of the other or into the environment, and if you start thinking good, bad, for and against, it creates a block, and it's kind of like an unempathic way of relating, and you're kind of like saying, well, let's start with the empathic way of relating, of looking at people's values, feeling into their values, feeling into their experience, and kind of coming into the situation with that uh, creative, empathic way of being. And you're kind of tying that in with different values. There's kind of like, kind of a sense, maybe it's a sensitivity to values, of, of others' values and what's important to them. And maybe they're going a little farther, maybe even their needs and desires and hopes and aspirations. Absolutely. And I, I and, and like that piece of paper, I think it's empathic reasoning that we come to mm -hmm. a deeper understanding that, hi, <laughs> a deeper understanding of, you know, better answers to the problems mm -hmm. that we face. Um, this book, I have, I want you to read it. It's by David Norton. He was a philosopher at the University of Delaware. He passed away from cancer. This book is so brilliant and so much about what you're doing and such a big influence on me. It's called Imagination, Understanding, and the Virtue of Liberality. And just in the first part of the book, he says, foremost among the traits, character traits that are required of, are you there? Because you just mm -hmm. froze. Okay. Oh, I'm here. Maybe I just look like I'm frozen. I'm no, 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 the froze. <laughs> okay. You're in this uh -huh. kind of impressionistic experience like Monet. Um, character traits that are required of individuals in order to sustain a productive, multicultural world and the place within it of their own societies and their own lives. Foremost among these traits is the virtue of liberality, the readiness to affirm truth and value in systems of belief and patterns of conduct different from one's own. The acquisition of this virtue is dependent upon humans of the imaginative capacity to lend themselves to alternative viewpoints. So we are lending our humanity, 
Our humanity is on loan. It's humanism. Paul, uh, Peter Buffett talks about it. He says at the end of that article, something brilliant, he says, money should be spent trying out concepts that shatter current structures and systems that have turned much of the world into a vast market. And he says, it's, is progress really Wi-Fi on every street corner? No, it's when a 13-year-old, when no 13-year-old girl on the planet gets sold for sex. But as long as most folks are patting themselves on the back for charitable acts, we've got a perpetual poverty machine. It's an old story. We need a new one. I think this is all interconnected. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the uh, the morality. You're kind of connecting it, it to morality. Like, how, what is the kind of the basis of morality? And the basis of morality is that empathic connection of kind of experiencing others and, and being in that relationship versus what you had talked about before, kind of what we have now in terms of uh, for and against. Yeah, for and against. But even it was even the paternalistic um, aid, giving of aid, where you know, it's like, oh, we'll give you aid, but it's really me giving you aid, and it's not really a relationship, and it's a kind of a paternalistic uh, looking down kind of an approach, and that's kind of like the, there's a whole industrial complex being created uh, around that uh, form of, uh, you know, giving. And it's based on what we think is important. Mm -hmm. And no woman, no young girl can be sold for sex it's not possible if you're empathizing with this girl. So, in other words, the new system, the new story that Buffett is talking about and that Bloom is addressing as well in his own way is a new moral, a, a, a whole, I mean, a whole new, um, I don't want to put it the way he put it because it's so good. He says we have a crisis of imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, it's we can't stay with the current structure and so Bloom from where I sit is encouraging the continued patriarchal structure of the of the hunter hunted mm -hmm. and this is it again Leonard Schlein addresses it in his book the alphabet versus the goddess another brilliant book about the subjugation of women the subjugation of feminine values um, just literally by dualistic thinking mm -hmm. Just but, dualism in and of itself is patriarchal. Mm, so you're you're saying that the dualism, this dualism way of thinking, for and against, good, bad, is a kind of a patriarchal system in it of itself, and it is kind of what is causing the uh, kind of the social problems. It's even part of the me giving you aid, kind of in that whole attitude, and um, that we really need is to. Uh, it's uh, there's a shortage of imagination, which maybe is why you call your your theater the imagined uh, life. the imagined life. Uh, you know, acting is the art of empathic imagination. Is because we're imagining. We need to the morality that you're looking uh, for is like an empathic morality that's based on empathically imagining ourselves into the experience of others, and our actions uh, kind of flow out of that. Well, um, maybe. Yeah. Well, more, well what, what Paul Bloom talks about is that he's concerned about the, what he calls the moral implications of gut-wrench empathy. Well, first, my first statement about it is really it's not gut-wrench. We can come with a predetermined state. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. But also that moral, just the word moral means good-bad. Oh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And moral... If we have a new morality that says it's it's not good, bad, only, as Shakespeare said, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So good in one geography, good in one culture, good in one um, tribe isn't good for the other. So this good, bad, moral, moral morality as good, bad, for and against, either or, or I think we have to re look. We have to look, at, take a new look at that system because I think it's part of the subjugation of women, part of the subjugation of feminine values, part of the subjugation of the mother and the child. Like that piece of paper, are one. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, 
black and white. It's one. You know, Barack Obama, he intones Barack Obama. Well, he's a perfect example of both and. He's not black or white. He's one. Mm -hmm. One so it's really. Mm -hmm. It, you're saying that the morality itself is kind is a uh, in a sense is it, I almost want to say it's immoral, but it's in, in a <laughs> sense I don't know that's not quite that it's it's almost that would like, get real trouble. <laughs> I know it's like morality. It's like it, it's there's another word. I guess for me it would be empathic. The empathic is a way of being, and morality is a different is a separate way of being that is in itself dualistic. And so there's really there's a an empathic way of being, and then there's a moral way of being. And the moral way of being is not very empathic. I would love to see morality a new morality a uh -huh. morality that is not. Um, ensconced in Judeo-Christian uh, ethics that come from patriarchal thinking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd love to see a, a more um, feminine values injected into that conversation. Um, the word implication, he's concerned about moral implication, implication inherent in the word implication is our capacity to imagine the future. Well imagination Schlein talks about it again brilliantly in his book, far better than I'll talk about it today. I would love to see you have a dialogue with him because he's extraordinary on these topics. But, you know, it, Ramachandran taught us, the skin is a lie. If I anesthetize your arm and someone massages mine, you'll feel it. We're one. Mm -hmm. the, the morality of either or good, bad is the dualism inherent in morality, that's what it is. It's the dual, as you said, the dualism inherent in morality, that's the system, that's the thinking, the perspective we need to re-examine. Mm -hmm. And I think Paul Bloom has done us all a service. Because he has a son, as I said earlier, he's, he's a father. You know, I think he's done us all a service by writing this article and encouraging us to think more about morality, about the topic of morality, about the current perception and perspective of morality, and in what ways what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander. I mean, one of the things that he talks about here, and you know, he's a cognitive psychologist, brilliant man, intellectually brilliant man. However, I find I found it, and I hope I'm not being. Well, we started off the whole thing with me talking about Yeah, being about wrong. Be, tell, tell it the way you want it. <laughs> we started the whole thing with Google Hangouts being a virginal experience you know, for me. But, but you know, because I Skype, so this whole Google Hangouts thing is new. But I found it hilarious that, you know, he spoke of, going, he, he talks a lot about mirroring and going to the movies. In his other article, The Kindness of Stranger, that's a kindness of strangers, that's a statement from Streetcar Named Desire. He's talking about empathizing with people that we don't immediately identify with. It's a whole other article. But in this article, after he talks about Barack Obama and after he talks about, um, you know, uh, what was his name? Adam, was it Smith? Adam Smith talking about empathy. Yeah. The theory of mind. After he talks about that, he talks about going to the movies and watching James Bond getting his testicles smashed mm -hmm. as an empathic experience. And all I could think of as a woman was, Paul, is empathy that painful for you? This male, mm -hmm. arch you know, mm -hmm. this male archetypal sexual god has his testicles smashed and every male audience member feels it, that's what empathy is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mirroring. If I empathize, I literally get my manhood taken away. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that. Yeah. So you're seeing that, uh, you know, he's kind of in his article, he's like, <laughs> he starts off by kind of, he goes through uh, kind of explaining saying Barack Obama supports empathy, here's the definition of empathy. And then as part of the definition, he's talking about uh, the mirroring aspect of mirror neurons. And then the story he's telling about, well, it's like when um, <laughs> James Bond gets his testicles smashed. So it's like, 
you, you have this uh, associational empathy is like getting your testicles smashed. And it's like this, you know, it's very, I mean, he's very creative, you know, in terms of <laughs> yeah. the, uh, so I mean, how, do we, how do we create the feeling of d dread for empathy? Well, we tell men <laughs> that, that it's, empathy is like getting your testicles, your testicles smashed. smashed. And so man, every man on the planet is, oh, my God, I don't <laughs> oh want empathy. <laughs> Right, that's very clever. Uh -huh. oh, thank you, but I, you know, it was the first impulse. I thought, wow, mm -hmm. you know. So obviously, I mean, as a woman, I'm concerned about about empathy and about mothers and their children, and about how do we move forward in our world. You know, you know, obviously, we're the borders. We're losing our borders and storytelling. As an acting teacher, as a person who believes that the the master empathizers in the world, in my opinion, are Meryl Streep and Daniel Day Lewis. Those are the, you want to you want to talk to two master empathizers. Those are that, that that's who we should be speaking with. In my opinion, those are two mm -hmm. people. No, uh -huh. they're master empathizers. They're transformative beings, capable of empathy on a, a, a empathetic embrace. That is so wide. We just all aspire. In in my art form, we all aspire to be that empathetic. And I don't know. I would just love to see uh, more women talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if a woman was writing it. that, they might have started off with the story of well, empathy is like when you're, you know, holding your baby or something, you know, close, or you're you're hugging your partner or. You know, they might have uh, had a different story than the testicles being kind of <laughs> smashed. So, um, exactly. but I, when I was saying clever, I was saying, well, it's very clever of uh, Paul to kind of, you know, kind of start, you know, to get a visceral feeling about the uh, the unfortunate uh, features of empathy, which he well, certainly, of, certainly, any woman can empathize with testicles being smashed, but. Uh, the victim identity, the, the identi an identity effect is really among the male audience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there are, and I don't want to, you know, make it a male-female thing. I'm talking not male and female, but really feminine values, mm -hmm. which are the values of interdependence, the understanding the, that a mother and child has. And... Um, you know, if you get your testicles smashed, you can't bring children into the world, maybe, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, because we could really mm -hmm. take it this off. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, so... I, so you really wanted to set up, uh, see that there's this, these uh, feminine values, and that these f feminine values need to be uh, supported or nurtured versus kind of patriarchal uh, values and kind of a... Uh, kind of two different ways, maybe associating the patriarchal values with uh, a type of morality that's based on good, bad, and, and uh, right, wrong, versus uh, kind of an empathic morality, that there's a, a, an empathic morality that's really based on uh, relationship and what you're calling maybe feminine, you know, kind of uh, nurturing kind of... Uh, it is based on, on a recognition that we are interdependent. Mm -hmm. that we may look like the trees on your website, we may look independent, mm -hmm. but what happens to me does happen to you. And once we come in with that knowing, and that, so that's where cultural exchange is important, where we mirror cultures, when we go to the movies, when we watch a play, a screenplay, you know, um, a film, when we read stories, the storytelling, sharing our stories, that's when that becomes vital. Mm -hmm. And then after we share our stories, then we have some kind of dialogue. You know, it's not just cultural exchange, but it's cultural exchange with dialogue. And the system that Buffett talks about that I think needs to be, you know, reformed completely is the educational system. And that's a whole other dialogue that we'll have mm -hmm. at another time. But I really enjoy talking with you. Mm -hmm. so, much. so, so there's the um, the kind of it's like it seems to be the uh, kind of the patriarchal or or you know, the patronizing right wrong kind of approach, and then the the other more of an empathic approach, and and the um, and the empathizing, and that's kind of like based on the the sense of connection that we all are all connected, 
and that that's really the uh, kind of way to uh, go forward and create that morality of. of well, I think those are the moral lessons. Uh, those are the moral lessons. Yeah. Well, you know, I look at. Um, I don't know if you've got a minute here, but uh, I have to stop. I have to okay. stop because I have a client coming. Okay. Then I we'll end it there. Great. I really just. I can't tell you, you know, I'm sending everybody to your website, everybody's watching it. I, again, I just want to say, Edwin, thank you from the bottom of my heart for seeking me out, for encouraging me <clears throat> to think more deeply. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate you and look well. forward to our Indonesian meal. Uh, okay, well, I'm hearing a sense of gratitude from you. You're kind of <laughs> feeling sense of gratitude for me seeking you out and and uh, and uh, looking forward to us getting together for for dinner and uh, kind of an Indonesian one since I lived in Indonesia for a while. So, um, There's a and one here in LA. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, if I'm down there, I definitely will do that. Like I was saying, I don't travel a lot, but there are some good ones here in San Francisco. Too, okay. But, Thank I gotta you. come to San Francisco. <laughs> and we'll do an outdoor. You know what we'll do? We'll do an Indonesian meal, and we'll film a dialogue. How's uh -huh. that? Okay. There's uh, we can do that. There's uh, yeah, it's a nice restaurant, Borobudur, I think, in downtown San San Francisco. So. Um, I haven't been there for a while, so you're really make, making my taste buds and juices starting to flow here, thinking about it. Empathy. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel. You can feel. I love food, so it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I really was. I really appreciate the the perspective you brought about that, because I think it really kind of uh, addressed the whole framing of uh, the article. So I'm, that was a different uh, point of view that I hadn't heard. So I really appreciate that. Uh, kind of sharing that that insight is it uh, opened up I think some new understandings too to look at it from a different angle. Well, I'm going to send you a list of those authors that I mentioned and the names of their book because I, I think you're going to really dig these both of these books and I think there's an amazing dialogue that you could have with Schlein and he lives up in Mill Valley I think. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got a connection to any of these, please invite him. Um, I wish I had. Oh, you don't. I would it's love. Like, uh, I would love. He's just influenced. I mean, David Norton is in the Beyond, but you know, but we, but um, Schlein, sure. I mean, oh, I, I would love it. So okay, well, we'll I look forward to uh, seeing that and see what you know how I can follow up yeah. on that. So you, had, you, Edwin, everybody wants to talk to you. Yeah, well, hopefully, if not everybody. Paul Bloom does. <laughs> he will. He will. <laughs> I I keep trying. I keep telling him I'd like to empathize with you, Paul. <laughs> like I really, I'm really. My first instinct is to hear you, and I keep saying I just want to empathize and hear you deeply and understand <laughs> where you're coming from. And he said, and I uh, says, well, I'm really busy, so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say. So, okay, well, Diana, I don't want to keep you uh, longer, but um, thank you. So, thank you for taking this time to, uh, and we can follow up some other time too if you have more oh, time. Oh God, I would love to follow up. Other topics around this. I would love to so. talk more about all of this. Okay, great. There's much, much more to talk about. I just look forward to it so much. So, mm -hmm. we'll we'll connect by email. I'll send you those books, and we'll make another date. Mm -hmm. Another date, great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.